Chapter 2. A New Club While the other children helped their mother clear away luncheon, Pam sat down to write the letter to Froston. By the time the dishes were washed and the kitchen swept, she appeared with a neatly addressed envelope. I'll take it to the mailbox, Holly volunteered. And I'll help you, Sue offered. The sisters put on their heavy jackets and hurried down the street to mail the important letter. The trees that lined the sidewalk were nearly bare of leaves now, and the grass was brown. But Pine Lake, at the back of the Hollister's large, old-fashioned house, was as beautiful as in the summertime. The water was clear, and the pines which dotted its shoreline wore the same attractive green dress. As Holly dropped the letter into the box, she said, I hope, I hope, Mr. Postman with the snowmobile, that you will send us a good answer back. Oh yes, please do, Sue added. When the little girls returned to their big yard, they found Ricky standing under the willow tree on the shorefront. He was grasping a large paper sack. It seemed to be heavy. What's in there, Ricky? Holly asked, walking over to peek into the bag. Snow, the boy replied. It isn't snow at all, Holly said, wrinkling her nose. It's flour. Ricky grinned. It's make-believe snow. Look, I'll show you the start of a neat game. Make-believe we're in Frosted at the Trapper's Carnival. He began to sprinkle the flour over the ground. We're having a snowstorm, he said. I'll be the North Wind, Sue offered. She filled her cheeks with air and blew hard. I'm going to make a pair of snowshoes, Ricky said, after he had scattered all the flour. Want to help? Oh, yes. What shall we do? Holly asked. Give me a ball of twine, will you? Holly ran into the house. She returned with the twine and gave it to her brother. On the ground about them lay many thin willow branches. Ricky picked up two and twisted them into the shape of snowshoes. He handed one to Holly. You string this snowshoe and I'll work on the other, he said. While Sue looked on, her brother and sister sat down and crisscrossed the twine, looping and tying the ends over the branches. Finally, Sue giggled. They look like little tennis rackets, she said. Wait until after we've played this game, Ricky said. When the two homemade snowshoes were finished, the boy placed them on the ground side by side. As he tied them onto his feet, he said, Now I'll track down the wolves. I'm a trapper. Who's going to be the wolf? Sue asked. Just then, Holly spied Zip frisking in the weeds near the dock, just what they needed for the game. She called him, and the collie raced to her side. You're a wolf, Holly told him, as she led the dog through the flower snow. Ricky's going to track you. Zip looked up at Holly and gave a little whine, as if to say he did not understand the game. But when Holly led him across the flower again, he seemed to get the idea. Here I come after you, Ricky shouted, and he tramped across the flower snow. Sue and Holly laughed to see their brother waddling like a duck. I have to lift my feet high, Ricky explained. That's the way the woodsmen do it. Zip entered into the fun and kept out of Ricky's reach for a while before letting the boy catch him. It's my turn now, Holly said. Let me use the snowshoes. Ricky helped Holly put them on her feet. By this time, Zip knew exactly what to do. He circled around in the flower a few times, then trotted off, making little white marks on the grass with his paws. Holly went after him, giggling as she lift her feet high off the ground. Hooray, I caught the bad wolf too, she cried, as Zip rolled over on the ground and let Holly tag him. I want to turn, said Sue eagerly. Of course, honey, her sister replied. Here, I'll help you. As Holly tied the snowshoes on Sue's feet, the little girl said, I don't want to walk over just snow. Put some ice with it, Ricky. That's easy, her brother replied, snapping his fingers. I'll put water on the snow, and it'll freeze. 
Ricky ran to the lakefront and picked up a tin can, sometimes used to hold fishing worms. He bent down and scooped some water in it. Then he hurried back to the patch of snow and sprinkled the water on the flower. There, he said proudly, best make believe ice and shoreham. Sue smiled and stepped on the gooey white mass. It clung to the bottom of her snowshoes. Oh dear, this is the stickiest ice I ever saw, she complained, and leaned over to wipe the dough from her feet. But as she did, swish, boom, Sue slipped and sat down hard. Now you've done it, Ricky said. The ice is all over your dress. She, he and Holly helped Sue to her feet. Together they tried to wipe off the sticky flower, but only succeeded in getting their hands full of it. Finally, Holly said, you'd better run in the house and get cleaned up. We'll go with you. When the three children were halfway up the steps, Mrs. Hollister came to the door. Goodness, she exclaimed, what have you been doing? Don't track that paste into the house, Sue. Wait there until I get a cloth. Mrs. Hollister disappeared a few moments, then returned with a damp cloth and began to wipe the sticky stuff from Sue's feet and dress. She handed rags to Ricky and Holly and said, please clean the steps, children, and play another kind of game. Why don't you three rake the leaves in the front yard? The youngsters liked this idea. Let's make a big pile of them and jump in it, Holly suggested. Ricky hurried into the garage for a couple of fan-shaped rakes and a toy one for Sue. Soon the children were busy raking up the crisp brown, red, and yellow leaves. In a few minutes, they had a high stack of them in the middle of the yard. Ready for the jumps, Ricky commanded as he lined up his sisters near the pile. First, Sue ran and leaped into the leaves, squealing with delight. When she arose, they were sticking to her hair and tickling her nose. Holly had a turn and Ricky followed. He rolled over and over, scattering the pile. I have another idea, Holly said. Suppose I lie down and you cover me up. When she lay down, Ricky and Sue picked up big armfuls of leaves and dropped them on top of her. Finally, Holly could not be seen. As Ricky scooped up more leaves for good measure, Dave Mead, a friend of Pete's, streaked into the yard on his bicycle. Hi, where's Pete, he called as he headed for the pile of leaves. Ricky thought Dave was going to stop, but the boy shouted, here I go, right through your leaves. Ricky and Sue were so frightened that at first they could not make a sound. But finally, Ricky shouted, stop, Dave, Holly's under there. Dave jammed on the brakes. The back wheel locked and the bicycle skidded to a stop one inch from Holly's head. When she heard the screeching tire, Holly popped up. Not realizing the dangers, she said brightly, Hello, Dave. If you want Pete, he's in the house. Phew, was all Dave could say, glad he had not hit her. Are you fellows going to a football game? Ricky asked, hoping to be invited to go along. No, Dave replied as he propped his bicycle against a tree. I came to tell you some news. Just then, Pete and Pam came from the house and ran up to the others. Guess what, Dave said. I hear we're gonna have a swell new club at school. Really? Pam asked. What kind of club? I don't know, Dave replied. The story's around that Mr. Russell will tell us Monday. Mr. Russell was the principal of Lincoln School, where the Hollisters had enrolled two months before. The children liked their new teachers, especially Miss Nelson, who had Pam's class. The Hollisters got along well with all their classmates, with the exception of Joey Brill, the neighborhood bully. This unpleasant boy was always making trouble for them. All the children were excited about the new club. I can hardly wait till Monday, Pam exclaimed. I do hope it's one I can join. After they had made a dozen guesses about the kind of club it might be, all the children went in the house to watch a football game on television. But the new club was uppermost in their minds. 
When Monday morning came, Pete, Pam, Ricky, and Holly set off for school. When they arrived, they found other children talking about the mysterious club, but no one knew what it was. We haven't long to wait, Pam said excitedly as the bell rang for assembly. After all the students had filed in and sung the Star Spangled Banner, Principal Russell motioned the children to be seated. He made several announcements before mentioning the new club and everyone was fidgety. But finally, he said, Miss Nelson is going to form a pet club. Anyone may join. Everybody clapped enthusiastically. When they stopped, Mr. Russell added, I'm glad you like the idea. Many children who have pets want to learn more about animals' habits, so this will be a good opportunity to study them. The club will organize in Miss Nelson's room after school today. The Hollister children could hardly wait for the final bell to ring. When it did, Pete, Ricky, and Holly hurried to join Pam in Miss Nelson's room. By the time the teacher rose to speak, the room was filled. Miss Nelson, a short, dark-haired woman with a friendly smile, counted those present. 25 club members, she exclaimed. That's splendid. Then she told them that the pet club would meet once a week. First, they would elect officers and then plan their program. I'll be the president, called a voice from the rear of the room. The children turned around to see who it was. Ugh, Joey Brill, Ricky whispered, gazing at the tall, heavily built boy of 12. Does anybody nominate Joey? Miss Nelson asked. A boy sitting beside Joey did this, grinning. A girl named Alma on his other side seconded the motion. Joey must have planned this in advance, Dave told Pete quietly. Dave raised his hand. I nominate Pam Hollister, he announced. She loves animals and knows a lot about them. I second the motion, said Ann Hunter, Pam's best friend. A girl can't be president, Joey stormed. Miss Nelson rapped for silence. Of course a girl can be president, she said calmly. Are there any other nominations? There were none. Miss Nelson passed out white slips of paper. This will be a secret ballot, she said. Please write your choice, fold the paper, and hand it to Donna Martin. There was a buzz of whispering from most of the children. But from the back of the room, Joey's friends talked loudly as they tried to persuade the children to vote for him. The ballots finally were handed to Donna, one of Holly's playmates, who had big brown eyes and dimples. Please read them, Donna, Miss Nelson requested. The seven-year-old girl opened the ballots, making two piles of papers, one for Joey, one for Pam. The children listened eagerly as she read them off. Finally, each candidate had 12 votes apiece. There was only one vote left to open. Donna looked up at Miss Nelson a bit fearfully. This one will decide who's president, she quavered. 